know that there's people here who have experience and comments and thoughts. Charles. So uh, moder modernism is always being uh, packaged and sold to us as beneficial to our good health. Uh, that's been, that was true 100 years ago, it was true 50 years ago, and it's true today. Uh, so I guess my question is, what modern things that are being packaged as beneficial to our good health should we be skeptical of today? Yeah, a great question. I always, uh, it's been my question for many years, like, when is someone going to do the Jane Jacobs book of the 21st century where they'll say, actually, everything you're doing is shit. I, I don't think you realize that. <laughs> this is just a small example of mechanical systems within buildings, true architects speaking. Um, you know, if you've ever been in the Tenement Museum in New York City, you can see that was pretty grim, actually, from a health point of view. And then with the influence from Germany in the 20s, you know, we had... Um, our house has windows in the closets because you had to air everything out all the time. Then we're now back into um, heavy mechanical systems. And in spite of what we know now about energy and energy efficiency, that's still being built. And I think that's too bad. You mean like artificial systems of ventilation? <laughs> yeah. So that would be one thing that's not so healthy, but it's supposed to have been healthy. Um, for me, it's probably the discussion or the debate around autonomous cars. Um, they probably will be safer and result in less, less accidents, but I mean, that's to me the least of our concerns about the automobiles. So I think uh, I would be skeptical about the promises made about how autonomous cars are going to make our lives not only safer, but a lot easier to get around and more. So that would be my uh, word. I have something to say on that. I called. Um the uh, engineering um, to see about someone who doesn't have a garage how he's going to um, power his electric car and they just said not our problem and I said aren't you happy that he has electric car they said no we don't want any cars <laughs> so that was a good um, first of all this is may sound like nitpicking but I don't use the word modernism Modernism is a really old term, ironically. Uh, you know, modernism as a term was ruined by modernist planning and modernist architecture. So people like me would never want to use that word again. If, I, if I'm going to use a word for up-to-date thinking or current thinking, I'll use the word contemporary. But modernist planning was a certain aesthetic, a certain value system that was a, horrible to cities. So it just doesn't nitpick. I don't use that word modernism. Yeah, like but current it. ideas or common uh, uh, contemporary ideas, uh, Yuri stole one of my two answers. Uh, so we're uh, unanimous in our commentary about um, uh, autonomous cars. I do find it fascinating that City of Vancouver's new report on autonomous vehicles by Dale Bracewell, if you know Dale, who's awesome. Um, uh, the entire focus of it is what we will do with the space that will be freed up by autonomous vehicles, and the answer is more space for walking, biking, and public transit, which is exactly the right idea uh, in terms of thinking about it, if there's a, a additional space actually created. So the answer I will give is, is sort of ironically almost on the other side, which is the, the move now to push to ban cars everywhere. Uh, which could re revert us right back to dead streets as what happened when we tried to ban pedestrianize cars, uh, pedestrianize streets in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, etc. Um, what I tell cities is you don't need to ban the car. Uh, you should work very hard in all of your thinking to prioritize it last, to deprioritize it. But for every place that has successfully banned the car on carefully considered streets or at times or what have you, there have been cities that have been clumsy about the idea of banning the car, particularly on shopping streets, and actually had to rip it up again later. So I believe it's one of those uh, cool ideas that urbanists all think is the automatic silver bullet for making places better, and it's not necessarily the case. I believe we need to deprioritize cars in our cities, but not necessarily, in, in many cases, ban them. Trevor. Um, Yuri, I'm glad you brought up St. Jane. And I think that has to be talked about in this forum. Um, the film summarized her entire Toronto career in 30 seconds. And the last eight books are a, a, a running 
graphic. Uh, those books are not taught in planning schools and not taken seriously by economists. So this is the conundrum of Jane Jacobs. She wanted to be a writer and wrote a brilliant book, the most important book on American cities in the 20th century, and some great articles and forums. But the latter career really went nowhere. She didn't want to be an activist, but was fabulously successful at that, and that's a conundrum. So my point back to you and the, and the Janeites is her strength is making narratives. She made a fabulous story about cities that needed to be told and is being retold. But she was not a planner. She did not make a theory of planning. And you can't build new cities out of the tissues of ballet and eyes on the street. Those are very good philosophies. They're narratives. They're not planning ideas. And I'd like to uh, suggest to you in the crowd that in the shadow of the, I think, overinflated reputation of Jane Jacobs, let's look at someone like Phyllis Lambert. Phyllis Lambert spent years fighting Milton Park in Montreal and saved a very important part of the city. She founded Heritage Montreal, the definitive heritage organization in the country. She connived with her family to build one of the most brilliant buildings of the 20th century, then wrote an even better book about it. If you go through the career of Phyllis Lambert, her accomplishments are significantly greater and more continuous in more fields over a longer time than Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs gave us a story. That's her power and her weakness. All right, let's get into Call it. Back from <laughs> anyone, anyone, anyone want to argue with that? Well, I'll say that again, um, I mean, Jane wasn't a planner and she admitted she wasn't a planner. I think one of her strengths was though, is that, and I'll kind of plug for Jane's walk that's coming up, that her legacy of getting citizens and residents and community members involved and engaged and part of the process and part of the understanding and realizing the importance that all of us have in shaping the future of our communities. I think that was her true strength. Yeah, I think of anyone yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I think Jane would rule in her grave if she thought someone was using her vision to plan a city that she had never stepped foot in or a community that she never saw. I think, you know, it's the activism, it's the, the observation, and getting planners to start thinking and looking and being, you know, being that. So I agree that she, you know, didn't have a great impact on the exact form of our cities, but how we think about them, how we continue to think about them, and more importantly, I guess, I would say how we should think about them and engage with them and the, the power that not just opposition and not just the pl placards and the marches, but the observation and the consciousness is, the, again, back to the consciousness is the best weapon, the understanding of what's going on in your community and how you can affect and evoke change. I think that's what I would say her lost in legacy is. Um, I've known. Phyllis for a long time. I was, I'm from Montreal and I was part of the beginnings of Heritage Montreal as well. Um, she is great. They're both great. <laughs> you know, I don't think we have to say one's better or the other. But Phyllis had a very different um, approach, I would say. She was equally passionate. Uh, she had the background of architecture, which was helpful and not helpful, but she truly saw the value of buildings and um, first in LA and then Montreal, she did everything to save them, including buying one of the big ones herself. So I would say it's not a one or the other, but they're both great. Um, but Jane, I would say Jane's influence has been a lot bigger than Phyllis's, unfortunately, they both. I would also say that I'll be more vigorous in my disagreement with Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> that I also, which is not surprising, right Trevor? Um, Jane's uh, influence has been more positive on cities. You know, I, I, I like Phyllis Lambert uh, in, in terms of the Center for Architecture, for example. But, you know, she came from privilege. She had money. She was the opposite uh, in terms of her ability to influence, influence from privilege. Uh, and um, Seagram's, which I presume is the building you were talking about, is a modernist icon. You know, I'm less critical of modernist architecture than I am of modernist planning, which is worse. But I still don't like modernist architecture. Uh, Seagram's is harmful to the street. It's, it doesn't create a great public space. It's, it's one of those buildings where an architect has to stand with me and tell me why I should like this building. 
and, and none of it is intuitive. So that's why that building failed. So, you know, I, 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 if pound for pound, you want to you, you wanna make it one or the other, I give it to Jane. Um, and your definition of, of Jane's influence on planning, not planning ideas, not a, a model for, uh, I can't remember if it was a model. The distinction is narrative. She's a story. Yeah, well, narrative, narrative is part of planning. And one of the big failures of planning is we haven't been good enough at narrative. We're boring and we're technocratic. Narrative is critical. It's I spend a lot of my time thinking up better ways and more persuasive ways to give messages to the people who will ultimately make decisions and to the community in terms of the conversational things. Eyes on the street uh, influence the way we design for streets. A lot of these things, if they're not planning ideas, they're certainly urbanism ideas. And I say those two things are the same thing because I don't have a reductionist definition of planning. I have an expansive definition of city planning as a profession. Jane profoundly affected uh, the thinking of, of, of city planning. When I said that she has, limit, lim, has had limited effects on a lot of cities on what was built, it's often because I go back to my point that planners for a long time didn't have a lot of influence. But that has been changing. As, as a profession, we get more credible, we get better at communicating, etc. Great. Uh, that was a great question. Uh, um, yeah, so um, there's someone uh, in the middle and then uh, a woman at the back. So you in the middle first. Um, one of the things that was sort of touched on indirectly in the movie, but I think is really important today in Vancouver and Toronto and New York, is the influence of cataclysmic money as these massive flows of money coming into the city. And J. Jacob talked about it in Death and Life, mainly as saying, like, this isn't a good thing. Um, recognizing like, the constraints that the city has to deal with this kind of thing, how would you interpret her uh, views on this today? And what would you add to how we can cope with that kind of thing uh, occurring in yeah, Toronto, Vancouver, New York, and elsewhere? Okay, that's great. You, you, that's not Mitchell, is it? I can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, it's very hard to see. Uh, anyway, for those of you who didn't hear, Mitchell was asking, um, what about the role of cataclysmic money in the city, which Jane Jacobs did talk about? And obviously, you know, um, in my coverage of, of Vancouver, one of the things that people have said over and over again is one of the reasons it developed the way it did is because there was such an incredible flow of capital into the city. Um, which allowed uh, architects to do all kinds of things, have commissions, and, and uh, you know allowed for an incredible rate of development and sometimes some experimentation. But it was this incredible flow of capital. So, um, you know, what do you think she would say about that? Was the question? I think based on the movie, um, although I, later on. So, sorry, based on the movie, one of the things, the capital that was coming in at the time in particular, and Robert Moses' capital was government capital, it was the infrastructure money, it was the 90-10, there was a thing up there. So, um, so it was funny, and today the money is private sector money, which is a different side of the coin. I think she'd be opposed to both of them and have problems with both of them because they do impact change. I mean, it's not so much the money, well, it's... It's that they change things overnight. It's the suddenness. Of, it's not the incrementalism. It's that, and it's the external people imposing their will and their views without knowing the context of the neighborhoods and the observations. So, fast money, easy money, external money is always problematic. Um, I don't know if there's a well. The solution is to find ways to limit the fast, easy, quick money. Um, on the flip side, I find it interesting today that part of the issue here in, North, in Canada and BC in particular is the government has been hands-off infrastructure for so long and they're finally getting back, but I really worry about them getting back into the wrong way again. You see it a little bit now with the Massey Tunnel, um, you some of the problem, like the pipelines, the Site C, like there's a lot of investment in big, in, big major infrastructure projects that we have, you know, so we're getting hit on both sides, not only by the private sector investment in our city and urban form, but also new government funding in new ways that we need to think a little more carefully about. No, just a little thing. It's hard for cities who need the tax dollars to do the things they really want to do to avoid uh, the money that comes into the city. At the same time, I mean, and and then with respect to transportation, I think, particularly in Vancouver, that's our strong point. Now. That's our that's our strength is the bank, the transportation group at City Hall right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think uh, Yuri's answer was excellent, so I won't uh, repeat that. The only thing I'll add is uh, I, I'd be curious to know Jane's in, uh, response to our density bonusing public amenities system, because when it works well, it's a system that literally leverages private money to pay for public amenity, including affordable housing and things like that. So as as it's been put, it's, it, it takes private capital and applies it to the to things that contribute to the commonwealth, which is a very neighborhood focused kind of thing to do. And we do it better than any other city in the world and more successfully. Although the development industry has successfully um, been able to vilify it to ordinary citizens such that uh, people actually blame it for high prices, which is ridiculous and false, by the way. Uh, the, um, I, I'd be curious to know her own perspective uh, about whether it's contributing to some of our challenges in our city or it's just helping us build neighborhoods that frankly have more event amenity and more diversity than similar neighborhoods in other cities that can't leverage those kinds of things from development. And it's kind of channeling that cataclysmic, cataclysmic money into neighborhood amenities. Yes, yes. and if, if you accept that the money would come anyway, which I do, the money's not coming because of the density bonusing system. It's coming because it's coming. You might as well leverage a portion of it, but in the context of what the market will pay for real estate anyway, because it doesn't add to the price. But you're leveraging a portion of it, lowering the property value and paying for things that other cities would kill to pay for in terms of amenities for livability, uh, different housing types, rental housing, social housing, for more diversity within neighborhoods, etc. Okay, you had a question in the back, and then I think I'll wrap it up after that, so um, make it a good one. So, so the question here is um, how to, uh, asking people to tap into their inner activist and how would you um, uh, resist and oppose the province's Moses-like plan for, uh, for the Massey Bridge. And you're the one, the only person who identified yourself as an activist, so <laughs> I think it's your question. I'm not sure it's my question, but um, I find it interesting that there doesn't seem to be a big activism against these projects. And I work in Australian cities, for example, where there's a huge amount of activism fighting these kinds of big regional infrastructure projects. And I, I kind of hear crickets uh, in, here in Vancouver when it comes to opposition. Or maybe I'm just not listening to the right social media or something. But it isn't, or, I, I would like to see more organized activism. The problem is, you're out in the burbs now where you probably get just as many people being activists for the road projects because they want to drive easier, which they won't do because of induced traffic and the law of congestion, but they think they will. Uh, so that's one of the problems. You know, Jane says, ask the people what they want and look at how communities are already behaving. Well, out in the suburbs, people want cars and parking and the community's behaving in a car dependent way. So does that mean Jane would say, fight to protect that? I would think not, given her commentary about uh, mixed use and density and the magic of cities and streets, et cetera. So it's, the politics out in the region are weird. Uh, so if you, and, and you can't come from the inner city and go out and fight the politics and be activists against road projects in the suburbs, because you're just those Vancouverites coming out and, and fighting projects that we out in the suburbs want. So the politics are really tough. Yeah, although it's interesting because um, Richmond councillors have been some of the loudest voices uh, against it, and I think that's pretty effective because they are right in that area, uh, and so they have a credibility. The only thing I'll add is, if we're going to oppose things, and I think we should oppose things more like those rural projects, we have to be more interesting. The thing I get from Jane is she was clever. 
I find a lot of our opposition to not be all that clever and not very good at understanding what media uh, will find interesting and that can create kind of um, uh, momentum and, and, and viral uh, things, etc. And when it comes to social media, I think uh, the, the, the forces of evil have proven to be better at social media than the forces of good when it comes to smart city making. We have to be better at it. I see everyone nodding their heads. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like on that. that, I have not the specific answer to your question, but just some observations. One on the, it's interesting that on the opposition to the Massey Bridge, it's the mayors, it's the elected officials, it's the quote unquote establishment who's leading it. And it really is the grassroots and you know, not that Jason Bateman spoke up, or, but it's it's the Taxpayers Federation and stuff to make it easier to get business flowing. So it's kind of that reverse. And the other thing I'll say with the provincial election on is I find the like the Portman bridge tolls and how politicians are rushing to to reduce and make it easy, like cheaper to travel over the bridges. I mean, it's smart politics, but it's again we're we're losing that battle in terms of smart planning and smart community building. So I think right now, actually, I'm, you know, and the other thing I'll say is the cure congestion motto of the mayors is perhaps though even worse, worsely conceived or more poorly conceived than the, uh, than their transling or the referendum uh, campaign. So I think you really, we have to th rethink who's leading our future here and uh, re-engage with, I mean, the mayors, I love I love their ideas, but they need a new comms team. So elect funnier mayors, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I want to thank everyone for hanging in. Here's Tim almost 10 o'clock, you all get a badge saying urban nerd. <laughs> um, only in Vancouver, I think, would there's something like this happen. Uh, so, and I'd also like to thank our panelists very much uh, for their insightful comments about the film and about Jane. <laughs>